Joining us on POTUS is Dr. William Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University, the co-author, among other things, of News Verdicts, the Debates, and Presidential Campaigns. He is tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Trust you had a wonderful weekend, uh, engrossed in all of the cpac goodness that was taking place in Washington, D.C. Well, one of the things that really struck me um, was that the coverage of CPAC's conference um, included on some stations uh, the almost full speeches by um, a couple of the individuals. And one of the things that I found interesting was that for the people in the audience, it was like red meat to them. And I think for a lot of people that are opposed to the issues that are coming up now with uh, gun violence and so forth, it had exactly the opposite effect. It's kind of like showing an ad, and and for some people it promotes them to buy it, and for others it moves them quickly uh, away from the product. And I think that's something that both CPAC and the NRA and other groups have to consider when they have very public presentations of their information. I think it's a good point. I I don't know exactly who did everything. I know we aired the president's speech in its entirety, wound up being about a minute and an hour and 14 minutes long. But one of the things that I did have a conversation with when we were broadcasting from CPAC was with some of the Republican and conservative leaders who were there. I said, do we does America really still want to hear crowds shouting lock her up, which happened when President Trump uh, was speaking? And I and they pretty much to a person said, no, I think we'd like to move beyond that. Um, and, and so, to your point, there is a sense of the well, campaign think, still being run that is not playing well to the middle part of America. Well, I think also the comments by Loesch, uh where she was saying that um, uh, white women, uh, mothers who lost their children, plays well in the ratings. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that most Dana Americans Lesh from the uh, from the NRA, right? Yeah, it's going to they're going to be respectful of that type of comment. Uh, so, um, you know, the, it's it's the combination of the CPAC conference and, and NRA that have been taking place that really um, raise uh, the, the gauntlet for those in a very polarized situation in the United States. Uh, yes. the, the latest polls are showing, for example, that while among Republicans, Donald Trump is still holding his base. He has 80 percent of uh, self-identified Republicans in support of him. Among Democrats, it's down to 5%. And the real important number is the independents, 35%. And that number was very important to Donald Trump to be able to win the presidency. Uh, we actually have in, in many states in the United States more independents than we have either Democrats or Republicans. And that's going to play into, I think, the midterm elections as well, that, that big group of independents, uh, which way they slowly move, either for or against Trump or for or against conservatives were more towards a liberal perspective or at least a moderate perspective. Bill, you watch uh, the media, you watch how people react to things. Is there something different this time around about the reaction to another tragic shooting or is this going to play out along familiar lines in your estimation? Well, uh, an interesting question. I'm teaching a course in public opinion and propaganda pretty soon in the spring. And one of the things I went back and I downloaded the uh, speeches of the NRA after Sandy Hook, uh, not Sandy Hook, uh, the um, the uh, shooting in, in Connecticut, uh, the shootings in Aurora, the shootings in different places. And the speech is always pretty much the same, you know, the thoughts and prayers, and then the comment about how we need to be strong and how we have to have a right to our, our weapons. And I think For me, one of the things that really struck home is thinking back to the 1960s, the coverage of the Vietnam War. When the war first started, uh, the media was basically on the side of U.S. involvement. Uh, There was not a lot of coverage against the war. Uh, But as time went on and we reached the middle to the latter part of the 1960s, the tide of the media turned. And when that happened, American public opinion dramatically turned as well. And the question is, is this coverage that we're seeing now, for example, about uh, Florida's shootings, um, the the big town meeting where they were successfully able to get Marco Rubio as a Republican and and the the Democratic senator from Florida on the same stage with the children that had 
uh, witnessed the shooting and, and others as well, has focused an attention that I haven't seen in the past. A lot of times it was uh, the left versus the right or the conservatives versus the liberals. This is, it seems to be much more broad-based. And the question is, how long will this attention span of the public and how long will the focus of the media continue to play out in terms of gun violence and the issue of guns? How important is the president's attitude in this? He seems to be open to certain action. Well, the, the issue with the president is that he seems to be open to actions, and then a day or two later, they change. Uh, we saw that uh, numerous times. Uh, the most recent one was over immigration. Uh, you know, he was for a, a much more open, loving immigration policy, and then he basically turned around and sort of went against that. And I think, you know, the issue is that His biggest proposal was essentially to arm teachers, Um, and uh, the teachers don't want to be armed, and it's reminiscent of what happened a few years ago when the suggestion was, let's arm airline pilots. Airline pilots fly planes, teachers teach students. They're not security officers. They're not policemen, and as a result, I think that initiative for the broad base of the public fell flat. I mean, you saw the teachers' associations coming out strongly against it. The issue with the uh, guns and having more hardened targets with more police got very much, I think, undercut by the fact that there were um, multiple uh, security officers with guns that did not go in when the shooting was taking place. So it's a very difficult uh, path for the president to try and navigate an agenda that Right now, the evidence is stacking up, not in his favor. And, and by the way, this has really uh, overwhelmed, if you will, the, the, the whole conversation about the Russian memo, uh, about dealing with DACA, which is, uh, there's a deadline of a week. We have a Congress coming back for just a couple of days that has to deal yet with a, another continuing resolution, because this one runs out on March the 23rd. All of that pretty much has been pushed aside by the conversation about guns. Exactly. And I think that what happens is that the the public, um, while it wants to focus on politics sometimes, is in this overload mode. I mean, we had 14 Russians that, uh, 14 people that were indicted in terms of the Russian uh, scandals. You have uh, pleadings again by uh, Gates uh, that's got Manafort kind of more and more in hot water. The other side of the coin, we have uh, Jared Kushner's uh, security clearance issues and about him handling, you know, top secret information. All the while, we also have every night the Olympics. So where is the public going to focus? You know, each of these things has been a distraction that's been going on with which way will the public go? The the infamous uh, Republican memo about what happened with uh, the Russian uh, scandal um, came out, and then the Democrats wanted theirs. They couldn't get it for a couple of weeks, and when it finally came out, it was sort of buried in the, the confines of all these other news stories. And I think it's kind of a lot to expect that the public is going to be able to sort it out. In a lot of ways, the media has to provide that sort of agenda-setting function to help people understand what's really important and for our leaders to have time to deal with these issues. And right now, you know, with DACA and everything else, there's a lot on our political leader's plate. Bill, uh, last question. We're running short on time, but I did want to throw this at you because Diane Feinstein yesterday failed, or over the weekend, failed at the Democratic Convention in California to get the endorsement of her own party as she runs for reelection. And I wonder if this is something that Democrats are going to have to be watching for around the country. Well, I was a little bit surprised as well that she did not get the uh the endorsement. That does not mean that she's not going to run, and it does not mean that she's going to to lose. I mean, if you think about the uh, senator from Alaska, she also didn't get her party's nomination, and she came forward and, and won the election. So parties, um, you know, take positions. They decide who to endorse. But we also have to realize that the power of political parties uh, started to get undermined by the progressives in the early 1900s, and they continued to lose their strength. Um, individual interest groups, big money, and media play a much bigger role than political parties, um, I, I believe, in, in current political, uh, the p- current political landscape. 
Bill Rosenberg, thank you as always. We appreciate it. We'll catch up with you again. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Dr. Dr. William Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University, uh, is joining us or joined us to talk about the politics of the day and tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg, at Dr. B. R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G.